Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be here on this soggy day. Um, before I get started into the meat of my discussion, I want to actually start with a little bit of history. And I have to say, my team warned me that that wouldn't be a good idea, you know, the, the whole stodgy old utility thing. But I, I'm going to take my chances. Um, it's hard to believe, but PG&E has been in existence and serving customers since 1852. We actually emerged in the midst of the gold rush as part of that incredible influx of people that came into the state. And I got to tell you, back then, the state census showed that we had a whole whopping 261,000 people in the state of California. Lots changed since then, including us, but let's talk about the state. Uh, today, we serve in northern and central California, which is our service area, nearly 16 million people over a 70,000 square mile service territory. Our service territory is extremely diverse. It includes the Bay Area, right, this incredible global hub of innovation. But it also includes locations like the Central Valley, which is one of the most important agricultural centers in the world. And you all have very different power needs. Over our 164-year history, the one constant that we've experienced is change. And I know that's trite to say, but it's really true. Our state has continuously changed and evolved during that time frame as have our customers and their needs. And so with that, we've had to change, and we have. Today, as we have this conversation on the impact of policy and the, and, and the, and the impact of those policies on market forces, particularly for renewable energy, we're going to be talking about some areas that, frankly, where more change is needed. As we do that, I think it's important to take a step back and fully appreciate what's really at stake here. Because it's not just about business models. It's not just about regulatory policy or pricing models or revenue models or who's got better incentives and whether they should or shouldn't have incentives or who's advantaged or disadvantaged. It's way bigger than that. The critically important issue underlying our conversation today needs to be about a different kind of change. And of course, I'm talking about climate change. It's real. It's man-made and its effects are already being felt. We really believe that. You could see it in the rising sea temperatures. You could see it in more and more intense hurricanes. Clearly, heat waves. Look what's happening in the Northeast this week. Um, look at the droughts that we have been experiencing. And of course, for us in California, the wildfires have just absolutely ravaged our, our communities. At, at PG&E, we believe climate change is the single most important challenge of our generation. And we believe that how we all respond in the near term is absolutely critical, as it will have dramatic consequences for generations to come. So we welcome this opportunity to be here today and to be part of this important conversation. Now, looking to the challenges ahead, the good news is we are not starting from scratch. We've done a lot already. The state's done a lot already. Uh, for some reference, back in 2003, PG&E was already serving about 11% of our power deliveries were from renewables, mostly wind farms, a little bit of solar, but we were already down that path. In 12 short years, though, which is nothing in utility world, 12 short years, we have tripled that. And today, we serve over 30% of the power to our communities that is RPS, that is Renewable Portfolio Standard um, Eligible. And we believe we'll be at 33% by the end of this year. The goal, the target that the state established was for us to be there by 2020. We've done this four years ahead of schedule, and we've done this ahead of time because we believe in it and we think it's the right thing to do. Let's talk about rooftop solar. In the year 2000, we had, you ready for this? 163, that's it, solar rooftop installations in our service territory. Today, we're proud to tell you that we've interconnected over 220,000, and we're proud of that. These are significant changes, though, to the state's electric supply mix in, frankly, a relatively short period of time. One of the biggest reasons that these changes were achievable in California and was because, frankly, the policymakers in California recognized that our goals and their goals had to be coupled with appropriate energy policies to advance the market from those early days to, frankly, the thriving market that we see today. We've evolved our policies based on the needs of the market, things like the, Col the, the California Solar Initiative, or the Renewable Portfolio Standard, or the introduction of a carbon market, or most recently, the passage of Senate Bill 350. And to be clear, PG&E and the other utilities in the state have been advocates in creating these policies and partners in executing them and making them successful. And frankly, 
We're going to continue to do that, both in terms of as our goals increase and as the market continues to evolve. California has also very forward think, has been forward thinking in terms of policies that have supported investment in the grid. Take smart meters, for example, and I was just talking to Frank about it a little while ago. California was the first state and PG&E was the first utility to really go big on smart meters, and they are foundational. Today we have over 10 million smart meters deployed through our service territory, and they've enabled an entirely new energy experience for our customers. Today, customers have unprecedented visibility of how they use their data, how they use their energy, and the data and information that they need to frankly be making informed decisions, like for example, does it make sense for them to put a rooftop solar unit on their home? Smart grid technology has been instrumental also in helping us to integrate ever increasing amounts of renewables onto the grid, while at the same time, and this is really important, driving near-term, real-time improvements in reliability as well as our ability to respond to outages, which is why, part of the reason why, we have record-setting reliability levels at PG&E is because of some of the smart grid technology investments we've made. The state has equally been supportive of driving energy efficiency and demand response programs, which are also foundational. To give you a sense, in 2014 alone, our energy efficiency programs helped customers save $160 million in energy costs. It's huge. In 2013, we actually targeted our own energy efficiency program as distributed energy resources and were able to delay investments in three distribution substations as a result by curtailing, by reducing the energy usage on specific parts of the grid. Through all of these efforts and more, we've been very focused on maintaining affordability for all. The fact is that electricity prices over the years here in our service territory have basically stayed in line with inflation. And our average bills here at PG&E service area are actually below the national average. So while we recognize that there are many challenges ahead, I've got to tell you, we're starting with some momentum. So where do we go from here to address the continued challenges of climate change? We think California and the governor are taking the right approach in driving towards a low carbon economy over the next 30 years. So SB 350 requires that the amount of electricity from eligible renewables be increased from 33% targeted to be completed by 2020 to 50% to be in place by 2030. It also calls for doubling of energy efficiency savings for electric and natural gas by 2030 as well. In support of all this, at pg &E, we have a vision for the grid that we like to call the grid of things. It, you know, we stole it from Cisco, the internet of things. The grid of things, it has a nice ring. The foundation of this grid of things exists and works incredibly well today. It connects smart meters with self-healing networks and control centers that provide unprecedented visibility and control that, you know, frankly, we've never had before. The grid of things is a flexible, multi-directional electricity grid capable of seamlessly integrating all forms of clean energy needed to decarbonize our energy supply while still being robust and reliable enough to power the likes of Silicon Valley. So when we talk about the grid of things, I like to use the analogy of our own home computers or our own smart devices, our smartphones. You know, our smartphones are, are fabulous. They're, they're a great tool in and of themselves. They're, you know, a little supercomputer in your pocket, right? But they're exponentially more valuable when connected to the network or to the internet because of how much more you could do with them and because of how much more access you have as a result of that interconnection. The same thing goes from our point of view uh, for energy technologies. A solar panel and a battery are terrific. They do the job right by themselves. But they're incredibly more powerful and capable when they're connected to the grid, along with solar farms and wind farms, hydro energy, storage, electric vehicles, and more. Today's grid is an incredible platform. It provides essentially universal connectivity. It provides scale which is critical if you're working to solve a major problem like carbon or, or climate change. And it provides reliability, both today and into the future. And now, the work we're doing builds on that to make it more flexible, more dynamic, and even more resilient. Because with a modern, resilient, dynamic electric grid, we can bring clean, carbon-free energy to everyone. We can offer our customers more choices, more control, and more convenience when it comes to the use of their energy.
But to succeed, we have to really change the way we look at what the grid is and, and, and really what it does. Instead of thinking about the grid as an interstate highway, right, delivering energy from point A to point B, we need to think of the grid as something more like the internet or even the cloud. It's a platform for integrating all these new technologies and changing the way we access and use energy. The same way, frankly, that the internet and the cloud has changed the way that we access data and information. So what's needed to kind of get there? To fully realize this future, we need smart, forward-looking energy policy that supports the continued changes that have been taking in the energy space. As we do that, we need to be mindful of the needs of our customers. And this is something I have to tell you I'm absolutely passionate about. As someone who is responsible for powering an innovation machine like, like the folks in Silicon Valley, but also as someone who is responsible for delivering electricity to 1.5 million customers at a low income, we've got to get this right. We serve everyone, and we take that responsibility very seriously. So as we move to a new way of thinking about the grid, and investing in the infrastructure that we all need, we can't leave some people behind, especially the poor. The clean energy future must be accessible and affordable to all. It also has to be reliable for everyone. When there's a storm or there's a you know, major earthquake someday, people need to know that there's someone they can count on to restore their power and restore their communities. Someone who has the scale, the resources, and the proven capability to get everyone back on their feet quickly and safely. So as we think about the policies that are needed to support this kind of future, the old traditional model that assumed that the only product you received from the grid was the almighty kilowatt hour is becoming obsolete. It won't work in a future when customers will use the grid as a reliability, a storage, an interconnection system that complements the new energy technology that they will have in their homes and businesses. We need a new model that appropriately recognizes that different customers have different needs and different opportunities to use the grid. It requires, frankly, a different pricing model for customers and potentially a different revenue model for utilities. Now, this is something that needs to be worked out transparently and in the open with utilities, regulators, customers, frankly, anyone who has a stake in this, in this discussion. But we all need to recognize that the model we come up with has to work for everyone, not just the privileged few. To close, let me just say, and I say this every time I speak, there has never been a more exciting time to be in this industry. I've been in the industry over 30 years, and oh my goodness, it is, it is change like we've never seen. In, a, in, a, in an industry that has been all about adopting and adapting to change, the type of change we're seeing now is unprecedented. We are really excited about today. We welcome the discussion. We welcome partnerships with folks and companies like Solar City and others who frankly have, we believe, an important role to play in the energy future and in the grid of the future. The stakes have never been higher and our collective success has never been important because this really matters. I got up every day truly thankful for the chance to make a difference and hopefully make a difference for generations to come. So I look forward to your questions and especially I look forward to the dialogue with Frank and Lyndon. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes just giving a quick update on the solar market and what we've seen in the solar market. So Gisa spoke about the importance of, of a transformation and us using clean energy. Uh, when, when I got into the business in 2006, um, we started the company uh, with, with two people. Uh, now the company has over 15,000 employees. Um, the industry itself, at that time, I think were about 40 or so thousand people. Now the industry has over 200,000 uh, people in, in, in the country. Um, the solar industry employs more people than the uh, coal industry at this point. So it's had amazing, amazing growth. With growth, scale, cost starts to come down. And the solar industry has done a tremendous job to get the cost down. Now we live in an amazing state. Uh, California is probably one of the best states, forward-looking state when it looks at its energy policy. And it created a program called the California Solar Initiative, a well-designed program um, that incentivized clean energy, but the rebate program reduced over time, which forced the ind industry to reduce its cost. 
The industry did an amazing job to reduce its cost. I mean, when I got started, the cost of a solar panel was $4.50 a watt, not 70 cents a watt. It would actually be less if it wasn't for the import taxes, but that's what the, uh, the, the current cost is. So it's come down dramatically. With all this amazing growth, when you look at total penetration, it's still very small. So the US total penetration of, of solar is just a little over 1%. The rooftop penetration, when um, you look at total energy sales in California, is just a little over 2%. So it's still very, very small in, it, in its start of its, of, its, of its creation. It's had tremendous success. It's grown really well. Its cost is coming down. Um, and we need to do things to accelerate the adoption. But don't get confused with the amazing growth and uh, the success it's having with tunnel penetration. Penetration is still very, very small. We need to get it to a much higher level. We need to get it to 50, 60, 70 percent penetration. Um, but right now, it's still only at, at 2 percent penetration. And that's in California, which is one of the, the, the best states in the country. But the interesting part is when you look at a rate of new adoption. This is the part that pe people often uh, uh, overlook. When you look at new energy being deployed in the country, because that's the right way of looking, looking at things, because you're comparing uh, total generation to an uh, infrastructure that's taken us 80 or 100 years to build is not a fair comparison. The right comparison is to look at new generation versus new generation. And if you look at the new generation of solar, it's now the largest single source of uh, uh, energy in the country. It's overtaken uh, natural gas, it's overtaken wind, it's overtaken coal. It's over 35% of all new capacity that's been deployed is, is solar. That's a combination of rooftop solar and uh, utility scale. So that's the real exciting part. So if you just stay on that trajectory, then it's just a matter of time before we get to that, that volume. So we're going to go from a 1% to a very, very large, a large percentage. The other real exciting thing is the penetration that, that's starting to happen and the market segment that's changing. When I got into the business, the only people that could go solar are people that had $50,000 of a disposable income. That's it. So product for the rich. Hands down, that's what, that what it was. Through cost coming down and financial innovation, the product is now available to, to most homeowners. And when we look at our market segment in uh, California, 38% um, of all our new customers live in zip codes uh, that are disadvantaged communities. That's our new customers. So it's amazing the penetration that we have in there. When we look at our workforce, half of our installers live in zip codes that are in disadvantaged communities. So we really, really are starting to have an impact on um, lower, um, moderate and lower income neighborhoods. It's our fastest growing segment. It's a market that cares about saving 10 or $20 a month. It really makes a big difference for them. Then something that I'm really passionate about is as we look at the long-term future over the next 15 years of what the grid's gonna need, um, the uh, investment that the grid's gonna have uh, nationwide um, over the next 15 years is over a trillion dollars. That, that's what the industry is planning on spending. A majority of that is going into generation and distribution cost and then transmission. Those are your three big categories, generation, transmission, and distribution. Generation and distribution being the, the majority of it. So when you're making these investments, there's got to be a long-term planning associated. You, you, do, you have to do your environmental studies, you then get your permits, and then you get the generation up and running. That process can take uh, you know, five to seven years before everything's up and running. But over the next 15 years, we're gonna spend over a trillion dollars in that. And so then what we push for is, as we look at making these investments, are we thinking ahead? Because if we're making the investments based on things that are available today, we'll be mistaken. Because the, let's say you're building out a, a gigawatt uh, power plant. That will take, from start to finish, five to seven years. Instead of doing that, what will the technology look like over the next seven years? If solar cost has come down dramatically, storage cost over the last three years has dropped down in half. The forecast over the next three years is storage costs have dropped down in half again. So to build out that infrastructure on a distributed system where you have solar and storage, you can apply all the grid-related uh, needs instead of making that big investment of, of the, the uh, large power plant. 
And if, if, in, unless we're thoughtful about that, what's going to happen is that large power plant's going to be built. The consumer is still going to adopt solar storage. It's going to happen. Then what is stuck with that stranded asset? Because now you have a big plant that the decision made a lot of sense seven years ago, but seven years later, it doesn't make sense. And then one of two things have to happen. I guess it could be three things. The ratepayer bears that cost. Uh, the, uh, whoever built the infrastructure builds, bears that cost, or it's shared. And, or more planning can be done, better planning can be done. Look at what, what the future is going to have, and look at what that value can provide, and not make that infrastructure upgrade. And so that, that's something that we, we've been pushing uh, for some time. As Gishu mentioned, uh, uh, a key part of the success is right policy, and also looking at revenue reform. We've got to uh, create a revenue reform where the industries are working together, solving the problem together, versus colliding. But right now, there's a lot of collision in, with the industry, and it's just based, based on the business models. And if we can change it, we can really create a program that works well for the utility industry, works well for the solar industry, and reduces the cost uh, for the ratepayer. Looking forward to your questions. <clears throat> Well, thanks very much. Um, so first off, I thought I'd start with a question to Geisha, which is uh, uh, the retail electricity rates seem to be at the root of some of the issues that you've touched on in your opening remarks. I think to help ground the conversation, I think it'd be helpful to the audience if you gave just a brief overview of how what retail electricity rates are, and in particular, the major components of a electricity bill, in particular, transmission, generation, distribution, retailing for, say, a typical uh, residential consumer. I'd be happy to, Frank. Thank you. So um, the, the rates are really a central issue to this. Uh, there are many rates and many different types of customers, and we try to find the right rate for each customer class so that they could get the, the best possible outcome for their business or home. But if you look at sort of the average residential customer, and, and for simplicity's sake, let's say that that customer's bill on average is about 100 bucks a month. There may be some of you in there in this room that have that, um, not me. <laughs> but typically, about half of, the, um, of that bill, 50% of that bill, is associated with the generation or the energy supply component. About 48% of that, 49, is grid charges. So the actual cost to deliver the electron that was generated on the energy supply piece, that T and D, the transmission and distribution component, are about 48, 49%. And that last remaining 1% is something called public purpose programs, which are to, to really, pr frankly, provide um, a discount to low-income customers. Now, if you look at the energy supply component, which, again, is about half the bill, PG&E only, only owns utility-owned generation that's, that actually generates electricity. We only have about 35% of that. The other 65% are third-party contracts that we've entered into over the years. And they're with solar providers primarily, but they're also with wind providers, biomass, and so forth and so on. Some of these contracts are short-term. Some of these contracts are long-term so that we can flex along the way. Because one thing that we are for, for all customers is we're something called the provider of last resort. We have to, at all times, have energy available to meet the needs of our bundled, our bundled customers. So if the sun's not shining, um, if there's a malfunction, we've got to have the power availability to those customers. More about that 50% energy supply. We make no profit on that whatsoever. It's a pass-through. And the Public Utility Commission has a proceeding every year to look at the costs that are going into that bucket, that 50% of the energy supply bucket, and they review it for prudency. They review it for, 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 for correctness, if you will. And they deem it to be okay. It's passed through with no profit whatsoever out to our customers. So we, we really have a very neutral position when it comes to the energy supply side of the business. Um, the grid is where there's, uh, the grid charges is where there's more controversy. Um, again, about 48, 49% of the residential bill of these grid charges. And here's where there's a little bit of a disconnect or a little bit of a problem. If you happen to be a um, solar customer with solar rooftop in your home, 
because of the way that you are being um, compensated for any excess energy that you generate and put onto the grid, you have the ability to, in essence, not pay um, for your proportionate cost of that grid service, that 50% of your bill, that 48% of your bill. So who does pay for it? The grid's still there. The services are still there. That, in essence, is the cost shift that we often talk about, where solar customers are shifting the cost of grid services to everyone who's not a, um, a solar customer. Now, you might think, well, how, how much can that be? That can't be that much. Well, we've done some estimates in working with the Public Utility Commission as part of the net energy metering proceeding that has uh, been going on for quite some time now. And there's a public tool that all the companies and all the different uh, interveners are supposed to use to identify what, what is that cost shift. And the estimate of that cost shift by 2025, which is only nine years from now, is that it can be anywhere between 3.5 and $6 billion going from customers that have solar to everyone else. And it particularly hits hard folks that are in the, uh, the low income range. It, it many times absolutely eliminates the care discount that they would otherwise have gotten. They get about a $30 a month, in some cases, discount. This solar subsidy offsets it. And, and that's where we have concern. We love solar. We love distributed solar, rooftop solar. Our concern is really about the cost shift going from customers that can afford solar to customers that, in many cases, can't. So you might just add, what's the CARE program, since I don't think anyone here is on the, the CARE program. The CARE program, oh boy, it's, um, it's an acronym, and I'm going to get it wrong, but it's a, it's a discount program. It provides a 30% discount to our customers that are in low income, uh, in low income situations. It's about 1.5 million of our 5.4 million customers are actually eligible for CARE and are on a CARE program. Is there something you want to add to that? Or yeah, you're... absolutely. I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> a cost shift of uh, three to, to six billion. Um, for those, I, I'd highly recommend, go, go to our website. Um, we've published a white paper. Really, really, uh, for those, especially those in Stanford who like to read uh, white, white papers. Um, um, talking about all the benefits that uh, solar provides. So, so yeah, here's the crux of the issue. Right, you've got to follow the incentive model. The incentive model of a utility, like this, is, this is nothing wrong, it's just the way it works, is it makes a return on infrastructure that it invests in. It's, 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 just, it's just a fact, that, that, that's what it does. So if you look at what solar provides, it provides more than energy, it provides a bunch of grid-related services, but the utility and any utility, it's no, no criticism at all to, to, to Geisha or, or PG&E, but any utility is being paid to never value it. Like, you cannot. It's being paid. You, if, you, if you accept the value, then you don't get paid. You don't get to make that future investment. So that's, that's the crux, and that's why we have to have revenue reform, that the utility is indifferent who makes the infrastructure upgrade. But right now, when you look at the, uh, the services that solar can provide, and we did a detailed study, and, and, and the one that we ended up choosing was, was uh, PG&E, um, uh, only because we, we're in the neighborhood, um, we probably hired uh, 15 grid engineers from, from PG&E, um, uh, so we, we really understand the, the grid uh, extremely well. And when you look at all the benefits that we provide, it's actually a net benefit to all ratepayers of close to a billion dollars by 2020. So it really is a massive uh, benefit that can be provided. But it's not a benefit if you don't recognize that value. That was the point I was making earlier. If you don't accept the fact that um, solar is providing more than energy and is providing additional services and has the potential to provide additional services, then that infrastructure and in the upgrades, the transmission systems, the distribution system, uh, the new generation, that's all, all that investment is going to be made. Now you've built two infrastructures. And when you build two infrastructures, absolutely there's a cost. You've duplicated the infrastructure. You don't need to do that. And so that's the, that's the, the uh, debate that we have um, with, with uh, uh, energy providers. Way to neutralize that is create a model where it is infrastructure as a service. Open up the infrastructure. Allow the market to compete for that infrastructure. 
whatever that infrastructure may be, the transmission upgrade, a distribution system upgrade, uh, whatever that uh, infrastructure might be, have the market compete for that. With competition, innovation will occur. Given fact, no competition, minor innovation, lots of competition, massive innovation. Um, without competition, how good would your phone be today? So you, you've got to have competition. Competition will drive products that I can't even think of today. Then the grid's super important. I don't want to minimize the importance of the grid. Have the grid manager or the utility manage whoever's building out that infrastructure and get paid on it. Gisha mentioned earlier that if they use services, they don't get paid on it. It's a pass-through cost. I actually think that's wrong because it never encourages someone uh, for uh, more services to come on because you don't make money off it. It is just a pass-through cost. Create a model where you can have infrastructure as a service. We're all familiar with Salesforce.com and software as a service. Where somebody else provides that infrastructure, the utility uses that infrastructure, makes money off that infrastructure, and provides that service to the uh, ratepayer. The net is the utility still makes money, ratepayer's costs will start going down, um, and, and you can have a competitive market. Another key point. We also cannot just look at it at any given point in time. The solar industry is only at 2% penetration right now uh, in terms of energy sales with rooftop solar. In California, which is the most uh, penetrated state excluding uh, Hawaii, like really, really, uh, uh, it's been great. But it's only 2% of total energy sales. The solar industry is going to evolve, and we have an amazing PUC that is also pushing the industry to evolve. You start off with providing energy. That's the first uh, phase. The next phase, you start off providing grid-related services. So that's voltage control, reactive power. And you can do that with smart inverters. And then the third phase, as you get more penetration, um, you provide demand load uh, shifting. That's solar, smart inverters with reactive power and voltage control, and uh, storage. And so you have to work into those phases. And once you hit to that phase, you can really scale it, and it's a benefit for everybody. Can I add something sure, to that? Sure, sure. I can't help myself. So you heard how important um, the grid is to Solar City and to other providers, but they don't want to pay for it. As a matter of fact, you know the rates as they currently are, they are shifting that burden completely on everyone else who doesn't have solar. So imagine what will happen when that one percent penetration is fifty percent penetration. Or let's, let's go wild. Let's say it's 100% penetration. Everyone has solar. Everyone has, a, has, a, has solar. The grid, still important, still there. No one's paying for it. How can that model possibly work? So we totally believe in the value and the benefits of solar and absolutely want to see greater penetration of solar, solar rooftop in particular. We think it's, it's a great benefit. But the pricing is wrong. And it's not right to put that share of the grid services that, frankly, they rely on, appropriately rely on, but they don't get to pay for it. The customers don't get to pay for it. Others do. And again, as I said earlier, a big, a big part of that are low-income customers. I, I think it might be useful to explain to people how the grid services charges are recovered. It's through a variable charge that, that you pay. Yeah, so, so grid services charges are the variable charges, volumetric in, in nature. So the more that you use, the more that you pay. And of course, there's varying tiers of customers. And um, right now, we're going from, we have four tiers. Customers that are in the fourth tier pay you know, 30, 35 cents per kilowatt hour versus customers in lower tiers pay 13, 14 cents, and, and so forth and so on. So as you move up that scale and you use more power, your costs are, are, are volumetrically sort of penalized to some degree. You're paying more and more. And yet, if you're a customer that's in the 35 cent uh, tier, which probably a lot of us in this room are, um, that cost shift of 35 cents is now, if you will, peanut buttered on everybody else. And it has an incredible impact on customers in tier ones, twos, and three. So it's, um, it's, an, it's, it's an issue today. I think our cost shift today, we've estimated at right about a billion, $900 million. But as penetration of solar increases, it really becomes a, an unsustainable situation. We worry about our customers' ability to pay their bills. Okay. Um, 
It's the all, how about if I... Because this I, is going to be a debate. In case you guys are wondering, <laughs> so, there so, is a conflict. <laughs> so let me, let me, let me ask a, the, my question. So, so essentially, I think you can come in and, and, and I think dovetail on this, is that essentially uh, the Internet of Things clearly is significantly reducing the cost of electronic devices that communicate with one another. How is this likely to impact how consumers get their electricity, manage their electricity consumption? That's to you, Linda. So I think that gives you at least a good way to go in terms of responding. Oh, is that me? Duty to okay. you. So I, to you. I'm still thinking You're of the, the other comments. Guy. So, so I'm not, I can't help myself. I just got to address that we're absolutely paying for the grid. In fact, we've given a billion dollars of benefit to the grid. Highly recommend you uh, look at that. Um, it's, I, I recommend it's, it too. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, it's a good study. Um, so, uh, but, but back to uh, you know, the, the question of uh, internet of, of, of things. Um, there's, a, there's a transformation happening. Our homes are becoming smart. Like, it really is. Um, and not just smart by you being able to program your thermostat when it should use energy. That, to me, is, is going to fade away. Um, that, that, that's nice to have. As soon, what's going to happen is your thermostat's going to connect to the grid, and it's going to know when to use energy and manage itself. That's the next phase, remote management of your house and your house speaking to what the grid needs, helping you, teaching you how to load shift. So one of the key things for the solar industry is we've got to start providing more and more services to the grid. Um, as, as solar expands in California, we have to move our customers onto time of use. So now we're going to teach our customers when is the best time to use energy. When I got here in uh, 1998, they, they were uh, starting to, to have rolling blackouts occur. And there were advertisements uh, from, from PG&E and everybody, use, please don't use energy during the day. Please don't use energy during the day. Lots of money spent on educating people not to use energy during the day. Most people still think, don't use energy during the day. Change. Use as much energy you possibly can during the day. Like, things are changing, so use as much energy as you can. But helping people educate that is, is the internet of things. So uh, when we start sending price signals to consumers on when is the right time to use energy, they will modify their behavior. Um, but you don't want to make it a manual process. You want the behavior to be automatic. And, and that's the exciting part, so I think, that um, distributed uh, energy combined with uh, smart homes can provide to the grid. I agree with everything you said. Um, the billion dollar benefit too? No. <laughs> just on the, uh, just on the, uh, the use of, of, of really wanting customers to use energy during the day. In case that it's, it's not clear, what's happening is we have so much um, solar resources, both at the distributed level, solar rooftop, as well as at a utility scale level, that on any given day, the amount of energy that's available from 10 a.m. to like 4 p.m. I mean, it's, it's a glut. It's enormous. And so what happens at night? The opposite, right? You hope that the wind resources pick up, but frankly, we don't have the same level of resources in the evening time as we have during the day. So we actually want to shift customers, um, and that's what time of use will incent them to do, to give them a price signal um, and to do something manually, or even better, as, uh, as Lyndon has said, to actually do something automatically behind the scenes. We think that that's actually a very positive thing. And the more customers have knowledge and uh, information available to them, going back to smart meters and now having better insights, the better that they can manage their, their energy usage. So we're, we're in violent agreement on, on time of use and on, uh, on moving customers to more usage during the day. So as, a, as my questioner prerogative, then as an economist, I'll say dynamic pricing, not time of use pricing, please. So it's responsive to real-time system conditions, not a higher price in the middle of the day, lower price at the end of the day, every single day. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll add to that. But, uh, okay, so we, it's, we've got to do things in phases. If you shock the system, it breaks. So educate customers first on, hey, time matters. Get people used to that. Then go into, oh, well, within that time, there's even micro times that matter. And you can evolve to, which is real dynamic uh, pricing. But, but, but we've got to phase into, uh, into this. Otherwise, you shock a customer, and then there's revolt, and we don't get that transformation occurring.
But I have to tell you, I mean, most of our customers, not all, obviously, but most of our customers, they want it to be easy. They don't want to have to be thinking about it. They want this to sort of be, they just want the lights on when the, they need the lights on. They want that gas flowing when the gas needs to be flowing. They want, for many customers, it's sort of out of sight, out of mind. So it's about making it easy and transparent and automatic whenever possible. Exactly. You've got to have the house think for itself and have it do that. Yeah, over time. And, and I think that's a phase thing as well. So uh, why don't we, since we're probably going to open up soon, I, I want to give each of you an opportunity to sort of to give your, your idea of the future of the California electricity market. So, you know, Geisha, why don't you go first in terms of, you know, sort of looking out 10 to 15 years, what do you think will be the major change in what PG&E looks like uh, uh, at the end of that 15-year period, PG&E and other investor-owned utilities? So I, I'll speak for PG&E. Uh, carbon is our North Star. We are all about what can we do to decarbonize the energy. We're looking at it from a utility scale perspective. How do we facilitate greater penetration of distributed level uh, energy, whether it be on solar rooftop or electric vehicles or storage, whatever it takes, it's got to be done. It's a higher cause here. And we also believe in community resources, community solar and the like. So for us, uh, 10, 15 years out, I think you can expect us to continue to be a leader in decarbonizing energy today. I'm really proud of this. 55 to 60% of the energy we deliver is carbon free. 30% of that is renewable. The other 30% is large hydro. We've got an enormous large hydro fleet in the Sierras back, back 100 years ago. Had, folks had the good vision to sort of figure out how to harness the water to turn turbines that eventually irrigated the, the Central Valley and the North Valley. So really focus on decarbonization. You can expect to see continued focus on, at PG&E to decarbonize. I think that you'll also see with more and more uh, solar rooftop penetration, which we absolutely see, and more choices being made by our customers to provide for their own energy. Now, remember I talked about that 50% of the bill being energy supply and then the other 50% being grid services and public purpose? I think that 50% energy supply will shrink. I think we'll be a more distributed type of energy provider in the state of California. So I think cleaner, more distributed, much more um, engaged with customers in terms of their choices, what they want. You know, not all customers are going to really be that interested in, in what we're doing, but for those that are really figuring out how to facilitate it. So it's about facilitating choice and control and decarbonizing, and frankly, I think more distributed over the years. Linda, do you want to respond to how you sort of your vision for what Solar City is going to look like as well as the, 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 the distribution utility, say, PG&E investor owned. Yeah, yeah. So following you, so agree 100% on uh, more distributed uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure. And the <laughs> I figured you'd like that. <laughs> the, um, but, but, but in all seriousness, the, the solar industry has to evolve over the next 15 years. We have to provide more services to the grid. Like, like uh, right now, we install a solar system with dumb inverters. We can install a solar system with smart inverters. It increases the cost slightly, but we can do that. And then you can provide reactive service and voltage control to the grid, which, which is an expensive service to provide. You so it has to be phased in, because if you, if you, once again, if you shock the system, you stop the innovation and you stop the growth. So the first phase is solar, straightforward um, uh, net metering. Second phase, solar uh, net metering, pushing customers to understand their, their load, so time of use. Third phase, solar uh, storage, uh, sorry, a solar smart inverter, and that's going to happen right now. So we're going to start deploying smart inverters by probably around um, Q3, Q4. Makes no difference to the consumer. In fact, the product is exactly the same. Um, it's just uh, an extra piece of equipment you install that provides services to, to the grid. Um, so that would be default for us by the end of the year, and we expect the rest of the industry to, for it to be default uh, by the end of next year for every single system that gets deployed. So that would be the next phase. That scales, and then storage is going to come down. So over the next three years, it's going to come down, and then it's going to drop down again. Um, and I have a fair amount of insight in what storage cost is going to be. Uh, the, so it, it's really going to have that impact. And so when it hits that next level of cost reduction, then that's the next phase when you include storage uh, into the equation, which can provide a lot more grid services due to total load balancing. And it's really important that our uh, policy and uh, 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 political leaders understand that. 
Because if they make decisions today based on today's technology, we're going to be left with stranded assets in the future. Hands down. He has a classic example. Right now, in Nevada, um, NV Energy is busy doing a study to determine do they spend a billion dollars on a natural gas uh, power plant. That will take, call it uh, five to seven years if, if it's up and running. In seven years' time, I can guarantee you the cost is going to be a lot lower, storage is going to be available, and you can solve this problem in a more smart way, a distributed way. Um, so, so we have to look at it that way. Otherwise, there will be uh, a stranded assets in, in, in the future. Uh, and then my, my closing remark is I just want to say, love living in California. Like, like it is, it's, it's a state that really understands the issues. Um, we operate in, in 19 different states. One of the states is, is uh, Florida. Uh, and I can tell you, they don't think the same way. Um, uh, the word climate change is banned. And the comments are made. Yeah, in fact, yes, yeah, the sad part is that now they accept that climate change is caused by humans, but nothing we can do about it, so keep on burning coal. Um, thank goodness uh, California thinks like we can do something about it. So why don't we uh, open up for questions from the audience. Uh, if you have a question, raise your hand, and please wait until the mic arrives at you. Uh, person in the back. You've both talked about storage. Uh, what is the status of the technological solution to the lithium battery exploding? So I'll start. I, I, we all, I also, the company, uh, the utility industry, also believes storage is a linchpin to really integrating all these renewables. It's, uh, you know, I'm not sure we have the chemistry right. Lithium ion seems to be the, the, leading, the leading chemistry at this point. Happy to hear that costs are going down today. The costs are, are pretty, pretty high. Um, it competes today. Storage competes with um, a great storage um, uh, provider, which is the grid. You have the grid available to you to sort of backstand and, and recharge those types of things. But we're all hopeful that, in fact, storage prices do, in fact, continue to go down because we think they're necessary. We've, um, the, the Public Utility Commission, again, good state policy, has really recognized the importance of solar. So they've asked that all the utilities, the investor-owned utilities, put in place storage of, of over 1,000 megawatts by 2024. So we're doing this slowly over time so that we can hopefully take advantage of lower prices down the road. So we had our first uh, request for offers, which is a, an open sort of request for, for bids, if you will. We completed that, and we, um, we selected, I think it's six or seven different providers, third-party providers. And we have our first 75 megawatts, or I guess our next 75 megawatts will be going in place anywhere between 2017 and 2019. So it's begun. It's about, I think California does a great job of making markets, of providing incentives, of really providing the policy in place to kind of get things going. I think that'll happen again here with storage. Uh, question uh, over here. Just, uh, I, I really know storage fairly well. Um, so in case anyone wonders, uh, our sister company is uh, Tesla Motor. And um, Elon Musk is uh, on, our, on our board. Um, uh, Tesla and many are really investing into storage. Um, they're building a, a factory in Nevada. Um, that factory is going to be uh, larger than all the lithium iron factories combined in the world, like all of them combined. So when you add volume to the equation, costs come down. And the forecast is that the cost is going to come down by half again over the next three years or so. And so then that will start having an impact. Then again, when that volume increases, because with that lower cost bracket, it allows you to penetrate into different markets. Not all markets, because it will still be too high to go into all markets. But then the volume will increase and allow you to go again, a, a drop to another level. Today, storage and solar is uh, feasible in Hawaii. So today. Um, uh, but... Hawaii's cost of energy is, uh, you know, over 30 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, but as, as things come down, it will become more and more affordable in, in other states. Next question. I'm just curious, given the uh, tremendous gains in efficiency in solar every year, what, what happens with all the five- and ten-year-old solar panels that are very inefficient? Who's, who's responsible for replacing them? And who's going to foot that bill? Yeah, so the... A big efficiency gain is cost. The actual panel efficiency has been minor. 
So really, really key to understand the, the differences. So panel efficiency has improved, but, but, but it's minor. So, so the, the difference between a customer that went um, uh, five years ago versus the customer that goes today is maybe two panels. So, so the, the technology is not like a computer which becomes obsolete over time. It generates electrons. Electrons are commodity. Um, it's going to work 30, 40 years. Uh, our customers store, uh, in fact, all of our systems, if you look at our forecast of production, are, are producing above forecast. This technology is extremely stable, very reliable, low maintenance. Um, uh, we don't even uh, clean the modules. We're just building uh, dirt into our production forecast and have natural rain uh, clean it and just we build that in. So super, super low maintenance. Um, and and it, it, the technology just worked for 30, 40 years. You touched upon Internet of Things, but the, the penetration now in building automation, outdoor and indoor lighting is extremely small at this point. But as that penetration increases, I guess I understand and we will have the same problem as the solar, solar i.e. there will be additional energy available. So how would you pay for I, I, the... I'm not sure. Which penetration? I'm sorry, I missed the beginning. So the indoor and outdoor lighting, the oh. efficiency of that, demand response, Internet of Things is just at the beginning of that. But yeah. you look at the companies like Digital Lumens and others, you see that that penetration starts to move up. Right. And they, they save 30 to 40 percent of energy. So how do you deal with... Well, you will have double problem now. No. No, no, it's all part of an integrated resource planning approach that we take in the state. And energy efficiency is the best resource by far. And, and it's one area where PG&E has really excelled over the years. And, and I give, again, the state has been very forward thinking and understanding and seeing, having vision about the importance of energy efficiency. So back in the 70s, when everybody was you know, consuming and not really caring and not even talking about climate change, um, California put in place some really strong language around the importance of energy efficiency. And since the 70s, we have embraced this. We have um, saved, through energy efficiency, the building of 30 power plants. 30 power plants we have not had to build because of the energy efficiency. We count on it. We forecast it out, not five or seven years, but we go out 20 years to look at the effect of market trends, customer trends, emerging issues to look at what type, what are the prudent investments we need to make. So we've been able to save 30 power plants, which is great news. We haven't had to spend that capital, deal with the permitting and the environmental issues associated with big, um, big uh, power plants. But more importantly, if we had built those power plants in the 70s and 80s and 90s, they would have probably been gas, right? Gas power plants. And so when we look at the emissions that we've saved over the years, We've saved the equivalent of the removal of 5 million cars of greenhouse gases that are not there because of energy efficiency. And then the best thing of all, I mean, from a customer point of view, they've also saved our customers $90 billion. So our customers have saved money. We haven't had to go through the very difficult process of putting in 30 power plants in our system. And, and I think this is probably best of all, we've been able to avoid greenhouse gas emissions. But we plan for it. We are, we are absolutely counting on energy efficiency over the, the near, over the near term and the long term. And if you look at SB 350, it calls for doubling. We're counting on that, and we know we can get it. We have a really good track record. So we won't overbuild. We won't um, uh, procure additional resources, if you will, for energy supply, because we're counting on that. It's, all, it's a very reliable, very reliable way of looking at our integrated resource plan. I have a comment on that, too. So Right now, the utility industry is going to uh, planning on investing over a trillion dollars in infrastructure over the next um, 15 years. Um, so, so that's a lot. Um, but by including energy efficiency in the planning, um, it's bringing it down to a uh, trillion. Otherwise, it would be more. But that, that forecast and that vision of including energy efficiency is something I'm trying to promote, that we've got to include uh, solar and storage and voltage control and the grid-related services into that forecast as well. So we can take that trillion dollars down, down to 500 uh, billion. 500 billion still sounds so big. But, but yeah, we can take it down to, to 500 billion. But if, if, you, if you use the analogy that, that was used earlier, if everybody did energy efficiency today, I guess say you had a magic wand, and everybody did energy efficiency today, 
and tomorrow you had consumed half the amount of energy that you did the day before, everybody, then other than the variable cost, which is the generation cost, everybody's bill would double. That's just the way it works. Now it's impossible for that to happen. It, 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 there is a phase in. It's the same thing with, with solar. It's impossible for 50% to go solar. Just won't happen. It's taken us 10 years to get to 2%. So um, it's a phasing approach. But that's why scale is so important. We had a question, question oh. in the back. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask in a future that we might envision with much more distributed generation, uh, how does the uh, provider of last uh, resort work? Uh, and particularly, what sort of investments in the grid or centralized generation would still occur? Yeah, it's, it's really a, a huge issue. The provider of last resort basically means that no matter what, the utility has to make sure that it has the adequate power necessary to, to make sure that customers' lights stay on. And so um, it's difficult. Unlike energy efficiency, which you could take it to the bank, you know it's not going to happen, some of these other distributed energy resources may or may not be there. And it puts us in a really bit of a, of a quandary sometimes in terms of what do you plan for? What do you plan for? I can tell you that as we look out 10, 15 years, um, we're not going to be building. I, I can't imagine building new power plants. I mean, I, I really, again, I, I really believe we're going to be more distributed. Our, our per capita energy usage in the state of California and with, within PG&E certainly has been flat for, since the 70s, while the rest of the, the country has been sort of increasing at a pretty modest, at a pretty good clip, right, in terms of energy usage per capita hours is flat. So we know our customer base. We know what we can expect in terms of our own resources and what, what they can provide. We are going to count big time. I mean, we're really going, we're going to double down on, on, uh, on energy efficiency. We're going to continue to work with solar providers to, to effectively utilize DERs um, where they make sense, and we think they make sense an awful lot of the time. And, and so I, I, I don't see utility-owned, a lot of utility-owned generation, um, new utility-owned generation coming online. More often than not, we're going to contract with third parties um, to give us flexibility. Some will be short-term contracts, some will be long-term, so that we can make sure we have enough as a provider of last resort. But the worst case would be having too much, right? You don't want to be in a situation where you're long on generation. So we're going to be, we're going to be, we have tremendous models in place. Uh, full production models that, that provide us a lot of insights and perspective that we're using to, to help make decisions today. So, so to add on to that, <clears throat> the, the grid provides an incredible service, and this is why policy is so important. As you phase, uh, as you look at a long-term uh, plan, you're going to have millions of solar systems deployed with storage. You've got to give control of that storage to the grid. You, you've got to have the utility to be able to use that so they can load balance everything and provide the energy of last resort. So that's, that's really, really key, is that they have access to it, that they can use it. Otherwise, what happens is, if, with bad policy, without doing that, then you're going to have all this infrastructure. Um, and the, the design is going to be for the customer specific. Customers will still be connected to, to the grid, but it's, it's just going to be the, their battery. They're going to use it. But now, now the last resort thing kicks in. Now you've got to build this infrastructure out to substitute this existing infrastructure that's there. So you, uh, as time goes on, 2% is not a big deal, but as you get to uh, 10, 20%, it starts becoming become a real big deal. You've got to give that control to the utility. Um, the regulatory uh, process for rate making seems to um, encourage utilities to invest more so they can earn more, and doesn't seem to provide an incentive to consider um, less expensive solutions. Um, it's been my experience and kind of uh, referenced earlier that PG&E seems to have been able to buck that trend and has developed an pr approach that focuses on capital efficiency. And so I guess my question is, how has PG&E been able to buck that trend? How can other utilities um, follow that approach, and do you see any upcoming changes to the rate-making policy? Wow, there's a lot there. Um, so we, we have a pretty healthy capital spend year after year. And so for us, we're not looking for new ways of spending capital. As a matter of fact, we're looking for capital efficiencies all the time. 
uh, and the transmission space is an example, just a couple of good examples. We've been able to identify uh, more effective and more efficient transmission capital procedures and processes and policies that just in the last two years have saved us $300 million. At the same time, we've looked out 10, 15 years at projects that were approved. They would soon start their engineering and permitting process because, you know, transmission projects take about 10 to 12 years. And we've identified a few that, frankly, we're like, yeah, uh, we don't think that they're needed, or at least they're not needed right now. We're seeing lower, right, continued energy efficiency and other things causing our usage not to be as high in the future as maybe was predicted in the past. So we're not all about more capital, more capital, more capital. We're actually trying to reduce our capital spend. We're trying to be more efficient and more effective. And, um, you know, we, we're very transparent in our, in our regulatory and our GRCs in terms of here are the projects we want to do. There's a, a very, as you know, a very um, involved process, a lot of interveners, a lot of opinions and perspective. We, our goal, uh, apart from decarbonizing, which is our, our North Star, is about keeping our rates as affordable as we possibly can be. We also know we got to deliver shareholder returns, so it's balancing that, right? How do we deliver good returns but keep our affordable keep our rates affordable, not get ahead of our skis on capital, because you're right, there could be a stranded cost risk if you do the wrong thing. So it's been about balancing all those different things. And you know, our, our, our shareholders, for the most part, have rewarded us for that. It's a pretty constructive regulatory environment and, and construct here in the state of California. And uh, we've been able to do it. Now, I hope we can continue to do it. Um, but we are very proud of the fact that we've done a pretty good job of balancing it all, while at the same time continuing to drive reliability and, and lower, lower carbon emissions. The, okay. uh, did you guys read the um, uh, Buffett newsletter? Um, he, he sent out a newsletter talking about uh, utilities and, and, uh, and saying that historically utilities have had the luxury of being sloppy or, or uh, over-investing, doing things uh, just to... Uh, increase their cost, which they can get a higher, a higher rate of return. Uh, PG&E has um, is not a camp, so they've, they've been uh, very thoughtful in this area. But many utilities uh, have, and the biggest thing that can help prevent this from happening is uh, competition. And so this is what uh, solar brings to the equation: is it brings competition to the market because if the now the utility will think. If I make this investment, my rate will go up X. Okay. If my rate goes up X, it makes it easier for solar to meet that threshold, and then uh, consumers will have choice and go, go solar. So it's an it's a important function, and now it, it forces uh, 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 utilities to think about it. Now, fortunately, the utilities in, in California have been thinking about it for a little while, but many other utilities will now have to be faced with that same decision to really be thoughtful in any infrastructure they make upgrade the make as it's enabling more comp competition. Okay, well, uh, I think it's, uh, it's lunchtime, and so please thank the speakers. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>